Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Ozymandias Project. Trireme Transit, the newest and most reliable state-of-the-art time-traveling transportation service, is now boarding for all new and returning passengers. Now departing, present ponderings. Next stop is Ancient Odyssey. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 12 of the podcast. This week, I got to chat with my friend Jessica Bernstetter, who is currently an anthropology PhD candidate at the University of Missouri. I first met Jessica when I was starting my senior year, and she was filling in for a professor who was out sick. I then promptly enrolled in a class she would be teaching in the spring semester, and the rest is history. I feel like this episode is halfway on topic, discussing the problems faced by current grad students and talking a little about her amazing research, and the other half seems like it's also just us enjoying catching up after not speaking for a while. I love this wonderful human being, and I know that you will too, so take care and I will speak to you all next time. Hey, Jessica. Okay. Super glad to have you on today. Like Thank this you. was a long time coming. Um, so you are an anthropologist, which is kind of near classics and um, kind of like near art history as well. Um, but it's really funny because all my time at Mizzou and knowing you and having the anthro department kind of right on the quad right next to us, I never really went around and did much with you guys so I kind of feel bad so (laughs) in your own words why anthro because I really and I think some other people would think oh that's really really close to classics why not just choose that or some sort of just just do (laughs) archaeology yeah that's a great question Um, and it's actually kind of funny because uh, when I came to University of Missouri for my PhD um, I had some fellow anthropology grad students approach me and they're like, so you're an anthropologist, but, but you work in Italy. What, what are you doing in our department? Um, (laughs) And they, I mean, they were, they were actually legitimately curious, you know, how, how that works. Um, Because depending on how your university is set up, you know, not a lot of anthropologists work in the old world. So it's, it's sometimes confusing to some people. Um, but the, the cool thing about anthropology is that it's the study of humans in all times and all places. So you can really do a lot of different things with that. So I, as an anthropological archaeologist, it's just a fancy way of saying that I use anthropological theory and methods um, to learn more about um, the ancient world. But in, in more modern times, there's really not as much difference between anthropological archaeologists and classical archaeologists as there used to be. So I feel like, you know, as we're kind of moving forward in time, um, those two fields are finding a lot more um, things in common. Um, So it's kind of neat to watch that. um, And it's really cool to have sort of that interdisciplinary relationship between the two fields. So, yeah, so Okay. Do you get a little, a little of that like imposter syndrome though? Sometimes <laughs> if you're like hanging out with a bunch of your uh, classical archeologist friends yes. and they're all like talking <laughs> and then you're just kind of like slipping in there in the convo, like, Hey, I excavated Pompeii. <laughs> like, you know, I'm, I can keep up with y'all even though I'm not doing what you're doing. <laughs> yes. I, d- I definitely have imposter syndrome. Um, so like I, I've been taking, sort of kind of like hybrid, you know, I'll take anthropology classes, of course, because that's my background. Um, But we have a really wonderful ancient Mediterranean studies department at Mizzou. Um, So I've been taking a lot of uh, classes with Dr. Marcello Mojetta, who actually uh, works at Pompeii, um, just down the road from where I do my survey work. Um, So I do kind of get a little bit of both worlds. And when I first started taking those classes, um, I actually presented at um, the Eugene Lane papers um, is kind of like a, you know, department uh, classics. It was kind of like a classics uh, art history and archaeology sort of combined local conference. And I totally felt imposter syndrome um, because I, I work in Italy and I, I started out in Sicily and then I eventually moved to Pompeii. But as an anthropologist, I don't have as much of that um, sort of 
kind of languages and literature background. Um, I more use, you know, statistics and, you know, different scientific methods to approach my research. So the approach is slightly different. So I, I was very nervous giving that presentation and I'm like, oh, they're <laughs> they're going to think I don't know what I'm talking about, you know, because just the, the framework that I'm using is, is a little bit different. Um, but it turns out I had nothing to worry about because everyone was so friendly um, and so nice. And once I started taking those classes, we just, you know, I felt like I was part of that group and they were all very welcoming. So it was it's it's been a really fun experience kind of being able to be a part of almost two departments in a way. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. Oh, that's so cool. I like that interaction. I mean, we like we like those interdisciplinary interactions, right, between mm -hmm. our departments. Uh, it just makes it feel a little more wholesome, a little more yeah. like we're not kind of on our own islands, I, mm -hmm. I think. Um, yeah. And OK, so I, I've set this up perfectly. So you <laughs> I, I know, at least uh, from <laughs> knowing you for a couple years now um, that you excavate uh, in Italy. And I know that you started out in Sicily and then moved to Pompeii in the last couple of years. So uh, would you tell us a little bit about what you're actually studying um, and what you're doing at Pompeii? Because I think when people get an image of Pompeii, they just think, oh, it's the place where, you know, uh, Mount Vesuvius went off and then a lot of people died. Mm -hmm. So are you excavating bodies? Actually, my work is, is less excavation and more survey work. Um, so of course, yeah, like what you said, when you think of Pompeii, you know, you think of all the beautifully preserved frescoes, um, you know, the, the cast of the bodies, you know, that are kind of frozen in time. Um, and so that's kind of the picture that most people have. But what I do actually is, I guess, a little bit more mundane. Um, I actually survey different properties and I photograph, document, and record water and sanitation features. So, um, you know, as, as we're on site doing our survey work, um, there's a lot of people, you know, like where are the bodies, um, you know, what kind of, they, they're, they're just, they're kind of focused on certain things. And most people don't have any idea that um, Pompeii actually had running water. They had piped water. Um, they had public fountains that used this pipe water. They had um, extensive public baths, which some people are familiar with too, of course. But then they also had flushing toilets, which most people don't think about. Um, so it's been really fun kind of exploring that and sharing that information with people to kind of give them a, a broader picture. Um, of what daily life was like in the Roman world. Cause we see a lot of these really fancy things, you know, all the pretty stuff, which is fun. Don't get me wrong. I love that stuff too. Um, but you know, most people don't think, you know, where, where are you going to find your bathroom? Um, you know, where are you getting clean drinking water from? Um, so it's this kind of interesting, you know, what we might consider mundane, but very important daily, daily life. Um, so that's, a lot of what I do. I mean, I don't know. But okay, well, if you're if you're an archaeologist or an ancient historian, sure, you'll be interested in a lot of the like, oh, where are the pretty frescoes, where are the bodies at, <laughs> like, where's all this cool historical stuff. But I think for most like modern audiences, that's kind of one of the first issues people think about when they say, you know, oh, if you could go back and live at any time, you know, when would you go? I think a lot of people would love to say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love to see ancient Greece or ancient Rome. Oh, wait, there's no there's no plumbing like it is, it's dirty. <laughs> right. It's gross. It stinks like there's mm -hmm. a billion problems that people say. So uh, from a more modern perspective, I'd say, actually, that's not mundane at all, because I think a lot of people would be really interested in your work, especially if they knew, wait. Pompeii had like flushing toilets wait what uh you know <laughs> no. I, I just uh yeah I a, as a classicist myself that's obviously not what what interests me but just also as a person living in the 21st century who mm -hmm. very often gets asked if you could go back in history to see a time when would you go to of course I'm gonna say oh well ancient Rome's definitely up there so mm -hmm. uh if I could go to a place where Hey, they have clean running water. <laughs> like that's right? that's probably what I'd choose. And if I was yeah. gonna like make a trip, sort of like a la magic treehouse books, you know, yes. where you just, like pick where you want to go. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I think you'd be like the first person on my list. I'd be consulting and be like, Hey, so can you tell me about this like toilet thing? So if I'm gonna make this journey in my magic treehouse, can you just like 
Tell me <laughs> Here's the roadmap. The- <laughs> right. I'm like, I'd be like, Jessica, where are the toilets at, man? Like, <laughs> you got to tell me because I'm not going back unless I know exactly where I can go to the bathroom. Right. It's clean. <laughs> like, where do I shower? Where do I get clean? So I think that's mm-hmm. a, actually really, really cool. Um, <laughs> so how did your interest, like, how did you get onto toilets? Cause I'm sure that's not something that you're going to just be like in high school. Like I want to study <laughs> ancient plumbing unless you, right. hey, unless no. you have a family member <laughs> or a friend who's like a plumber and you thought that was awesome. No disrespect to plumbers, like very vital job, but I'm just saying, mm-hmm. I don't think most, it's not where a lot of people's, you know, first instincts go. Yeah, no, right. definitely not. Um, like, as you mentioned earlier, I actually started working out in Sicily. That's where I did my first field school. Um, so I, when I was there collecting data for my master's thesis, um, I was actually studying, uh, transport and foray, um, looking at, you know, what kinds of things people uh, were trading and, you know, what, you know, sites or groups they might've been interacting with, um, based on, you know, what styles of amphorae were found, um, at this particular site. Um, and then kind of in the course of that research, things were going kind of slowly. Um, and I was waiting for permission to go back. And my friend, Kate Trussler, who's the co-director of the Pompeii Water and Sanitation Project, um, you know, she came to me one day, stopped by my office in Swallow Hall. And she was like, hey, so I just got permits for Pompeii. You know, I'm trying to bring some students down. Do you want to come along? And I was like, hmm, Pompeii. Yeah, let's do it. Like, let's go. So um, I ended up going with her uh, the summer of 2018. And um, that's, that's kind of how I got started. She had, um, for her master's, she had worked on, on toilets and sanitation. And she was looking at, you know, how many houses actually do have toilets? Cause there were a lot of scholars that were like, oh, you know, every other house had a toilet. She's like, but have we actually tested that? Um, so she started looking at that. So this was kind of a continuation of her project. And so I just kind of, I kind of came on board with that. So my focus is a little bit more on the water system, um, but we definitely, through our field school, we, we do a little bit of both. Um, so there's a lot of really cool variety. So now I get to really, I get to ask a really fun question, which I don't get to ask uh, many guests or at least not yet because I haven't had too many grad students on. Um, mm-hmm. So how far are you along in the dissertation process and <laughs> what is the dissertation can, can you give us any hints as to like what it's called or what it's on just so if people listening want to find it when it's done they can oh yeah um so the <laughs> I don't really have a set title um it's kind of like a, a working title so in anthropology we have the option you can write a full-length dissertation um which is kind of like you know the standard option, but these days, because a lot of people are going into academia and want to have a publication record, we also have the option to instead write three publications and submit them, uh, or three manuscripts to submit for publication. And then um, after that, you kind of write an intro chapter and a conclusion chapter and kind of tie them all together. Um, So I am in the process of working on um, three different manuscripts. So it's, it's kind of, you know, different parts of a project. Um, but the first one is looking at um, architectural visibility and water features. So how w- within a space, within a private home, um, what kind of water features are available? Because a lot of times um, fountains, you know, decorative impluvia, things like that, these were all used, in my opinion, to signal wealth because um, a lot of them are, you know, quite fancy. Um, and use, you know, a lot of different materials and things like that, that might signify somebody's economic status. So I'm really interested in trying to figure out, you know, if, if they're showing off these things, you know, where, where are they visible from within the house? What kinds of, um, you know, what kind of guests are they appealing to? Is it somebody who's, you know, walking outside the door and kind of glancing in? Or do you have to be invited for a private dinner in order to see some of these, you know, more fabulous features? Um, So that's one project I'm working on um, using geographic information systems. Um, So I do a lot of spatial analysis with that. Um, And then another project that I'm interested in is looking at um, where public fountains are located within different neighborhoods. Um, and trying to see, you know, 
how um, those are distributed. So is it, are these fountains, you know, kind of equally distributed across the site so everyone has equal access to them? Are they concentrated in different areas? So maybe they're catering to, you know, certain groups of people because the really wealthy citizens um, have, or inhabitants have piped water coming into their homes through lead piping. So if you could afford to pay for that, um, that in itself was a signal of wealth, but also, um, you know, a really nice, commodity to have because the water is just coming straight to you. Um, but for those people who couldn't afford that, public fountains is where you're going to go and get your fresh water. You know, you're going to take your amphorae or your basket or, you know, whatever it happens, to, your bucket or whatever. Um, and that's where you're going to haul your water back home. So that's another thing that I'm interested in looking at too. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, I'll be excited to see when you kind of finish and, and put the finishing touches on uh, what it turns out to, to be and look like. So uh, I did not know that you could actually just sort of bypass the traditional uh, dissertation. <laughs> it's, it's a relatively like it's in the last, I don't know, three to five years or something for our department um, in anthropology in other departments. Um, I have a good friend of mine um, that I did my master's with. And I think he has the same kind of setup at uh, University of New Mexico. So, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily an uncommon thing. I think more anthropology departments are moving towards that. Um, just kind of, it's a two birds with one stone kind of situation. If you're gonna need to publish to get into academia, you might as well kind of use those to fulfill your requirements. I like that model, I do. I mean, obviously you guys, it, it, it's a lot more sciencey than classics on its own. So you, we are looking at the same types of things, but obviously mm -hmm. what we're analyzing is vastly, vastly different. <laughs> we kind of try to answer the more uh, theoretical questions, the why is this here? Not mm -hmm. how does this work type of thing. <laughs> yeah. um, so it, it, I can understand it being a, a not as necessary, I, I suppose, for classics majors to, to be able to sort of do that um, in their grad programs of study, which is kind of sad because I think it'd be fun. I mean, you do have to publish no matter uh, what a what ancient field you're going in. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I've just I've never heard of that being a thing for, for classics departments. So um, yeah. if there are any aspiring anthropologists who want to look at ancient things though I think this is a, a great piece of information to know though I mean not every university is going to have it but if they if they know that it is an option uh, now people know to, to ask around and, and see if that's a an option for them so I think that's mm -hmm. uh that's really great um yeah so okay I just want to rewind a little bit to like sure. high school you <laughs> Uh, how'd you first hear about anthropology? Um, I, I, I'm going to venture a guess that it, it's a little more visible than something quite as niche as classics and mm -hmm. ancient studies. Um, but it's still not, you know, it's, it's not, I want to be a lawyer. So it's not immediately like law school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely is one of those fields that's not, as well known as, as other things, certainly. Um, I, when I was in high school, I, <laughs> I'm a pretty laid back person, but I do have some very type A tendencies. So I love to have a plan. Um, you know, I love to kind of, you know, I don't know, life plan, whatever you want to call it. Um, I like to kind of have some idea of what those next steps are going to be for me. Um, and I kind of, you know, enjoy planning for things, I guess. So when I was in high school, um, I knew I wanted to go to college. Um, neither of my parents had went to college. So it was something that was very important for them, for their kids to do. Um, so that was something that, you know, early on, they're like, you know, you should do this. Um, and I had always loved school. So it was kind of a, a no brainer for me, but um, I wanted to figure out, okay, if I'm going to go to college, you know, what am I going to do? I, I wanted to have that plan. So I, I think I was taking like different, you know, career interest tests. You know, I just found these random things online, like, what are you interested in? You know, so I'd fill out the little questionnaire. Um, and one of the results that came back was anthropology. And I had always loved history. And when I read the description, it reminded me, I was like, oh, you know, this is kind of really similar to history. Um, it involves travel. It involves research. I'm like, this is perfect. So I was like, probably a sophomore or junior in high school. And I'm like, you know what? 
I'm going to be an anthropologist. <laughs> um, and I, I thought, I figured, you know, I think I would enjoy teaching, you know, I'm going to be a professor of anthropology. So as like a 16 or 17 year old, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get a PhD in anthropology, which looking back now seems really crazy and oddly specific. Um, but that's what I decided to do. And, you know, every, every step of the way, fortunately has kind of like reaffirmed that I'm like, okay, yep, yeah, things are still going well. I still love this. Like, let's keep going. Um, so that's, <laughs> that's kind of how it happened. But my, my high school did not have an anthropology class. Um, it had a sociology class, which I took and I really enjoyed, um, you know, which has some similarities with the social sciences. But um, yeah, I, I just kind of stumbled into it. And it was great. It was, it turned out well. <laughs> well, you are part of the very lucky few who kind of figures out that Mm -hmm. what you want to do is a thing and then yeah. <laughs> you got lucky because you then single-mindedly were like oh yeah I know exactly what major I'm looking for in college and I'm gonna mm -hmm. do it and I'm gonna follow it through and luckily it only got better and better for you <laughs> um right. not to say it hasn't had its challenges for sure you know when you before going to grad school like it's that is a decision that you really need to sit down and and make with intention because there's it's, it's a rocky road, um, you know, but if it's something that you really love, it's definitely worth it. I think most of my friends who are doing PhD programs or are about to go into PhD programs definitely have said the same thing, you know, mm -hmm. get, get your tubs of ice cream ready. There will be a lot of <laughs> nights where mm -hmm. you're going to just want to like pull that out and then sit in front of the TV <laughs> and cry over ice cream. <laughs> Right. Question all of your life choices, you know, but <laughs> and, and then look at like young, successful people. I mean, I even do that, though. I, I, I I'm relatively pretty young still. You know, I'm 25 mm -hmm. and uh, I'm like, OK, I'm only 25. I've got a lot of life left. I have a, a lot I can still do. But I, I will admit, you know, sometimes I, I read my news app or I'll look at the TV and then it'll be like Greta Thunberg. 17 year old activist <laughs> like meets all these people at the UN and does this that and the other thing and I'm like right <laughs> what am I doing with my life don't compare that is the secret to life just to be on your own path I mean it's it's so hard like especially like you know you see other people doing all these really cool things like and even within your own field or different fields um you know but what we don't really see when we look at other people is all of the steps it's taken to get them that far and all of the hurdles that they've had to jump through I mean I this is oh god do I want to admit this is like maybe year seven of my dissertation um which is actually not atypical. I mean, that's kind of like the average they say is, you know, five to 10 years, but like I, I went straight from undergrad to my master's in anthropology. It was a two-year program. I did it in two years. And then I went into my PhD and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to be finished in three years. Like this is just, you know, I'm just going to stream right ahead. <laughs> um, and obviously look how that turned out. So, um, you know, one of the things being in a, field that requires, you know, research, especially field work research, um, there's definitely a lot of things that come up, a lot of challenges, you know, getting permits, being able to travel, having the funds to travel. Um, so I think, you know, classical archaeologists have these same kind of struggles too, like where, you know, funding is, is a major issue. So it's, <laughs> It's not quite as easy as some fields, you know, where you're working on your PhD and you can just be in a lab all day and, you know, just work towards something and, you know, make concrete, um, you know, progress. So sometimes, you know, in the humanities and certain social science fields, it can, it can be really challenging kind of, you know, meeting all of those different goals that you're supposed to in a timely manner, because there's a lot of different moving parts. I believe me. Oh my gosh. That was like my number one worry when I was thinking about <laughs> is grad school is a PhD program, a realistic option for me. And, mm -hmm. you know, I still may go back because I'm that perpetual student who just never <laughs> feels like I had enough time to take all the classes mm -hmm. I wanted to, to learn yeah. what I wanted to learn. Um, but you know, there's this pressure to 
you know, get up, get out of college. And if you're not going to go straight in because you can't get in or you don't have the requirements or you need more experience or whatever it is, mm-hmm. um, you know, they, they push you into the working world. And then I can see after working, you know, I haven't had a steady job until I got one last December. But mm-hmm. before then, you know, I graduated in spring of 2018. So I was kind of doing different small jobs that ended after four to six months, but I was definitely working and accruing experience, Mm -hmm. um, which any job is going to say you need, but um, it's that kind of, once you get pushed into the working world and once you kind of find a a place for yourself, I can see why it gets harder to want to go back to school because then you're like, no, I'm kind of comfortable. I'm finally starting to Mm -hmm. save. I finally feel comfortable. And I'm going to be like, so honest right here. It feels so fucking good to make money. (laughs) Like, yeah to be able to not be poor on a student's budget where Mm -hmm. then you're like either you're lucky and you got your school funded like through scholarships, but then what extra money do you have? Not much Mm -hmm. like, you know, you have to get a job and work your way through college or you're not lucky and you can't get everything funded. So then you're actually paying for college and then Mm -hmm. have to live on top of that. So to, to sort of get out of that cycle and then finally feel like, no, this is like, I'm, I can sort of maybe start saving for retirement or just like do something that mm-hmm. feels productive. Uh, as I sit here contemplating going to grad school for a one-year master's program starting this September, mm-hmm. uh, you know, those are things that I, I'm really starting to think about. So, uh, you know, those are, those are really serious conversations where you need to sit down and say, all right, well, mm-hmm. okay. If I'm, 25 now I turn 26 next September so Mm -hmm. I'm like well I'll be starting at 26 I won't finish until I'm 27 and then hopefully I'll have my MA but then I'll be essentially 27 and then maybe some kind of PhD program it won't probably be in ancient studies because I just I would have to do a bunch of stuff learn more (laughs) languages but uh, any PhD program uh, would take me at least five to 10 years so Mm -hmm. then I'm sitting there in my mid-30s and that's a lot of time that you kind of it's never time wasted for sure um, because education is never a waste of time but at the same time it's just uh, I think I read some report that was like the earning potential that people have in their 20s and early 30s this is like the time to max out this is the time Mm. where you should really be working and saving and like this is what's going to set you up kind of nicely early in life. So that way you're not like struggling as like a 40 year old. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a grad school is not for the faint of heart. Uh, (laughs) So you must be so glad that you're almost done. I mean, so how, how far are you from finishing? Do you think? Well, I, I had hoped to be done by the spring. Um, I'm also in the middle of planning a wedding. So that maybe wasn't the wisest choice. Um, (laughs) But, you know, I'm hoping probably, you know, over the summer, over the fall, just to kind of, you know, hopefully wrap things up soon. I've been done with classes for for a while. So it's mostly just the writing process. um, And maybe another round of field work. Uh, depending on how COVID plays out, of course. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping to wrap things up quickly. It, it feels like the end is finally in sight, which is really nice. <laughs> so we shall see. So how like stupid excited are you to finally finish up so that you can be called Dr. Bernstein? <laughs> that is, that is very exciting for me. I mean, because I kind of had this, this dream this goal you know for so long like it's you know that'll it'll feel really good when it gets here so hopefully hopefully I can wrap things up quickly is there any sort of like nostalgia though that's kind of like oh no like I've been working for this goal for my whole life and like once it's done is there any part of you that's going to be like you know I kind of miss working toward this or are you just gonna be like (laughs) no I have it I'm done ha 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 (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it is, it has been part of my identity for so long that I think once, once I do finally earn that PhD, it's, it is going to feel very strange. Um, But depending on, you know, I guess, depending on whatever path my career takes, you know, if I do kind of stay in academia or some kind of research, um, you know, I guess once you're done, you're always looking to that next research project. So I guess depending on how things go, it, it doesn't really end. It just kind of takes a slightly different form, (laughs) 
but uh, I am looking forward to the day when I can have a little bit of job security. You know, that's the one thing about grad school, kind of as you were mentioning before, but like, you know, even if you are able to get your program uh, funded, which I've been very fortunate to do through teaching assistantships or graduate instructor positions, um, you know, even then every year it's, it's very competitive. So, you know, every kind of around this time now, and, you know, you put your application in and you kind of cross your fingers and hope your contract's renewed for another year and, you know, hope to see how that goes. So once I graduated and hopefully find a job, you know, that'll be, it'll be nice to hopefully eventually have some sort of security in that sense. Well, you bring up such a good point that, you know what, like, I've made the executive decision. I'm just going to bring it up now instead of later as I was planning to. Uh, yeah, you you mentioned several times now this issue of funding. And as a grad student, I'm sure you, you bring a really unique perspective. I mean, I've talked to professors who they have their own ideas about why funding is important. But I think it's really important to hear from the people who are currently going to be affected by these funding issues. So mm-hmm. I like to plug on the podcast all the time that we hate funding our humanities programs, especially in this country. Um, and then there's so many reasons. Some, some of them, some of those reasons can be political. Um, some are just logistical. Um, some are just a combination of a bunch of other different things. But I know recently, uh, just as a Mizzou alum, um, <laughs> I saw that Mizzou's football program or something (laughs) just got like a 10 million dollar donation to build new state-of-the-art um like a a fitness room essentially for the Mm -hmm. football team which already got a 90 million dollar whatever a couple years ago to build a whole new end zone for a stadium that we're not even using right now because it's a pandemic Mm -hmm. Uh, like they're using it fine but what's the point if there's no crowd so it's these things that I know that uh, uh, athletic funding is always separate from academic funding because a lot of them are mm-hmm. like personal donations from right. rich alums. So I, I do know that that is not really connected to public funding, but that just kind of highlighted, though, the inequity in the whole system to me, at least, uh, because I think the first thing that I I saw when when asking fellow grad friends uh, at Mizzou, I said, you know, how are you guys doing? And one of them just kind of said, and it stuck with me, I think they're going to have enough money to fund my program mm-hmm. if I'm lucky. And then I think she said something like, instead of being able to take in several new grad students who they can properly fund, they only, it, they said it's, it turned into a logistical nightmare where they're like, we think we can only fund one, one or two new people. Mm-hmm. And that's obviously going to affect the size of the grad program. And these are vital decisions that if you can't attract new people, they, you know, they're, they often threaten to then say, okay, well, we're just going to take this grad program away Mm -hmm. because no one's doing it, which is obviously not, you know, that's, it's right. Not it's not like there's no it. interest. Yeah. It's just that they don't have. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely, that's an excellent question because that is such a growing and valid concern in the humanities and in some of the social sciences, like anthropology um, is kind of in that sort of weird middle space. Um, because as, as one person said, you know, we're the most humanistic of the sciences and the most scientific of the humanities. So we kind of occupy sort of, you know, kind of like a nice little space in between where we can kind of use both of those, um, you know, approaches in those fields. But um, yeah, that's, that's definitely something that a lot of departments, whether it's anthropology or classics, but um, a lot of these more like humanistic departments are kind of struggling with because yeah, we're, we're not receiving the funding. We're not able to bring in grad students. And in addition to not being able to fund your grad students, a lot of those grad students are the ones who are teaching introductory courses for your department. So when you don't have the grad students to teach those courses, the professors have to teach those courses. And if they're teaching those courses, they don't have as much time for upper level courses um, that are challenging, you know, the undergraduates or, you know, uh, the, you know, sometimes 
there might be grad student classes that have to get cut too. So there's, you know, when they're not able to offer as much variety, they're also not bringing in new undergrad students to help, you know, fund the program too. So it's definitely kind of a, a vicious cycle. Um, and it's definitely, I, I don't know, I don't know what the solution is except for to try to, you know, find more money somewhere. But it is hard, like you said, you know, when you see all of these, you know, donations to like the sports facilities, it's, that brings up a really kind of tough, tough question because yes, they are mostly coming from private donors. So it's unfortunate to see all this money being funneled um, into one particular aspect of the university rather than, you know, sort of the more educational aspects, but you know, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have a solution, but I wish, <laughs> I wish there was a way to kind of increase that funding. And I guess part of it, you know, maybe the people making those donations, you know, a lot of those people are probably, um, you know, have done very well in business or other different professional um, avenues, but, you know, not a lot of people go into, you know, classics or anthropology, you know, that have all these extra funds. So I think that's kind of where a liberal arts background comes into play, you know, being able to uh, expose students to different, um, different fields, different ways of thinking um, in these types of departments, you know, that's, that's where a lot of critical thinking comes in. So we like to train our students to think about the world critically and think about, you know, the space they occupy and, um, you know, how culture works and, you know, how we interact with each other. Um, so I think that makes them more well-rounded individuals. So if we can expose more people to that, hopefully we can kind of increase the value that those fields have or increase the awareness. I mean, they already have value in and of themselves, but, you know, hopefully kind of sharing that with a, with a broader audience would for help, sure. I would hope. For sure. For sure. Uh, I would say, yeah, I, it, we're in an interesting time because I know that Mizzou just got a fancy new school of music built, mm -hmm. I think, in performing arts. Um, and obviously the, the, like the performing arts and visual arts and, and all that stuff, they don't, they don't usually have rich graduates, patrons, whatever. I mean, it, it's a collective few who really make it either in Hollywood or as professional singers or mm -hmm. as professional artists, but uh, that doesn't mean there aren't any. Um, mm -hmm. And it's it's interesting because their plight is very similar to ours, I, I find, oh, only yeah, because yeah. There's, not, there's not money in archaeology. There's no money in being an anthropologist. There's no money in being a classicist. So a lot of people are just going to say, well, of course you can't just go to some rich alumni and beg them <laughs> for a gift the way I suppose the mm. athletic system is so different. I mean, you know, if you're lucky and you have a good program, you can send some college athletes off to professional sports where, of course, they're going to sign million dollar contracts. So, mm -hmm. yeah, if they're successful, oh, of course, just give back here, take a million dollars. <laughs> you know what we could do with a million dollars? We could get one of those cool, like <laughs> simulated lab things. What is it? Um, there's so many cool facilities that mm -hmm. I feel like people would love if we could provide it. It just takes money to yeah. do so. I mean, mm -hmm. where was I, I, when I studied abroad in the UK, there was, oh, I forgot which university, but there was a university that it was really known for its marine archaeology yes. program i remember you telling me about this yes yeah the, so mm -hmm. it, it essentially they had like a, a tank built in like a lab or a room mm -hmm. where it was big enough that they could fit like an entire replica ancient ship oh, and then so fill cool. it with water and they could literally observe what the aging process of how things age underwater, what would they look like after a certain time period mm -hmm. um, and how to, and learn how to do marine preservation based off of, you can just like get in a dive suit, go in that tank, <laughs> pretend mm -hmm. you're diving. And, and this isn't like a small tank. I, I know some people are like, well, how big is this? It's just like a 10 foot pool. I'm like, no, this thing, they <laughs> built it. So it's like 50 feet deep to mm -hmm. simulate real archaeology so yeah that's um, so cool right I was like I, when I learned about that I was like I think I want to switch to be 
I'm a marine <laughs> archaeologist, even though I'm not good with science and I'm not good with things, and I don't particularly <laughs> want to go underwater and, and cu- encounter a bunch of creepy sea monsters. But <laughs> I want to go study this. Right. Uh, and then there was a there was like another institution in the UK that had a a fabulous uh they, it um they built like a like their own dig essentially where they could give their oh, archaeologists nice. practice. So it's kind of like uh. Being from Chicago, I grew up with the Spurtis Institute. It's the museum of like Jewish history uh, downtown. Mm-hmm. Um, and right next to it, though, there was like a center for archaeology. Oh, this is embarrassing. I, I don't remember what it's <laughs> called, but there was something right next to Spurtis where you, it was like a dig for kids. So they oh, cool. buried like fake dinosaur bones. And then mm-hmm. they just it's like in a huge pit. And then you like throw a bunch of sand and dirt on it. And then kids can pay or parents can pay for their kids to like go in and then they give you like mini tools that they're like real archaeologists use these Mm -hmm. and then you take the the little brushes and then you kind of brush away and and (laughs) discover quote unquote the Mm -hmm. the dinosaur bones so I learned that they had that but like on a real professional scale where they literally did they could put artifacts and watch how they aged and do this that and the other thing and really train people and i'm like you know how much i wish that mizzou could have its own <laughs> like art mini archaeology lab that would be um, awesome you just need funding for that you know everything yeah. in this world needs funding it's so unfair so if anybody listening wants to write us a check <laughs> please please and and that's the other way i tell people they can 100 percent be involved uh for people who love the ancient fields, love the ancient world, love archaeology, but don't want to spend the years and the time to go to Mm -hmm. school for it. I don't think a lot of people realize, I mean, because unfortunately, we're still so uh, intimately connected with this sort of patronage system of rich people have to give us their money. So then Mm -hmm. we can go do our things. If someone was like, I don't want to be an archaeologist, but I want to be involved with archaeology and I want to, you know, sort of observe the process. Mm -hmm. If you're like a rich investment banker and you like archaeology, I mean, I hate to say anything that encourages the patronage system to continue because <laughs> I think it should change. But if you at any level want to be involved, if you can save up any kind of money and make a donation to an archaeologist or somebody in the field who you, whose research you just support, that money would go a long way. It could send oh, yeah. you on field work. And if you are literally the person who's like helping fund this i promise you will get access so if you're like how do <laughs> we always I go? take volunteers yeah right and it's like <laughs> i was i was talking with a friend the other day i was like if it's a question of you know you loved indiana jones and you want to go see some cool excavation hey if you love egypt and you want to see some mummies and some tombs if you have a good paying job if you can set aside some money and then donate it to an egyptologist who's like i want to test my theory and i want to do a dig here in egypt or in greece or or maybe in italy depending on certain things um yeah if you can just donate anything even you know five thousand dollars like you know it 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 is going to be a significant investment but even Mm -hmm. like a thousand dollars goes a long way for so oh yeah Um, and i don't think people realize that i think people kind of think Oh, I'd love to be involved, but you know, oh, this money, even a thousand dollars, it's not going to do anything. So I'm not going to give someone a thousand dollars. Um, I mean, obviously don't give it if you don't have it to give, but if you do and you think a thousand dollars is not going to do anything, so you're not going to donate it. Cause what's the point? That's totally wrong. Like it could help someone really, really. Mm-hmm. I mean, digs are not, um, they're not cheap. And I yeah. just, I find the whole de- idea behind digs kind of ridiculous. I mean, you have to pay them to go work for them. And then, you know, you have to pay for your own accommodation and your food the mm-hmm. whole time. So I'm like, gosh, it really is. Literally, you're just spending, spending, spending to get back a, a little of the time you're going to spend actually researching, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're in the field for, you know, depending on the program, it might be four weeks, it might be eight weeks, you know whatever it happens to be, but then, you know, the rest of the year, like people think, you know, when they think of archaeologists, they think of somebody who's just, you know, out there playing in the dirt all year, but really, you know, when we're working on academic projects, um, you know, like at Pompeii or other places, you know, we're, we're there for maybe four to eight weeks. And then the rest of the year, you know, we're 
recording, measuring, documenting, you know, doing analysis, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's not as, as glamorous as you might see <laughs> with Indiana Jones. Like there's a lot of, you know, boring data entry behind all of that. Um, but, you know, it all balances out. And, you know, if you really love it, yeah, you'll, you'll even suffer through the, you know, data entry <laughs> to get to the fun stuff. So it's, for it's sure. part of the process. <laughs> for sure. For sure. And okay. So you just mentioned Indiana Jones. This is mm-hmm. great. You're like hitting on all the points <laughs> where I want to go with these things. Um, yeah. So, I mean, all right, well, he's quote unquote, an archeologist, which we all know is really <laughs> funny because what we see on screen, I'm like, that's not what an archaeologist does. That's not archaeology. <laughs> they, it's it's the the showbiz Rise archaeology, mm-hmm. right? It's the showbiz archaeology for sure. Yes. <laughs> but have you seen? Because I don't, I can't remember. Have you seen any? Like maybe I missed them, but you know, are there any like movies or TV shows that feature like an anthropologist really as as your protagonist? Because it's so few and far between where they put some kind of academic with any kind of scholarly background as your hero. I mean, I think the first time I really saw any kind of nerdy, super academic <laughs> thing represented in in film as as like the hero was probably a rival and I'm like hey linguistics got a shout out because everyone is like oh that's that thing where you break down languages that I don't want to do and then boom a rival <laughs> comes out and everyone's like oh she just she discovered the universal language that's so cool and I'm like hey linguistics y'all got a shout out that's awesome right Let's have more linguists but I can't remember anything that did Ooh. like yeah the only you know as far as anthropology the only one I can think of is um you know the bones series if you're familiar with that um Kathy Reichs um who I I graduated from Northern Illinois University but she used to teach there before I got there which is kind of cool um but I mean she's the her character that she she and her character that she writes about um Temperance Brennan is is a biological anthropologist. So it's, it's quite a bit different. Um, so when most people, you know, if they have come across that, if you hear anthropologists, you know, that's maybe what you think of, but you know, in reality, there's, there's four different subfields of anthropology. So there's a lot of variety involved, you know, myself as an anthropologist is going to vastly differ than, you know, the work that a biological anthropologist does or a cultural anthropologist or or a linguistic anthropologist. So, you know, we're all being humans in some time, some place, you know, but the, the things that we focus on and the way we approach that is going to be really different. But I, yeah, that's, I mean, that's the only one that comes to mind for me, really. I'm sure there's other, I would hope there's other ones. (laughs) Yeah, I think because you just mentioned the subfields and there are so many different ways you can sort of bring in or be in anthropology, which is going to look completely different. I think when I first came to Mizzou and I didn't know classics existed, I came Mm -hmm. in as an anthro major um, just sort of, uh, I was, I was maybe an anthro for all of, you know, three, four months before I switched mm-hmm. over because I had that appointment with uh, my advisor who just said, yeah, this is honey. This is not what you're looking for. But because um, because when I when I went in for that appointment and then she was like, OK, here, we're going to plot out the next, you know, your graduation plan already to start thinking about the classes I need to get there. The first thing she said was, well, do you like what kind of anthro do you want to do? She's like, there's a lot of people who it's really popular right now, but you, do you want to be a forensic anthropologist? Cause she's like, you could go work in any police department or for the army and just like excavate crime scenes and remains and stuff. And I was like, no, fuck no. That's so scientific. <laughs> I hate science. And she was like, Oh, you hate science. She's like, why are you an anthro? She's like, it's really sciencey. And I was like, well, cause I thought that's what's going to help me study the ancient world. And she's like, Oh honey. Oh honey. <laughs> Uh, you want classics? Let's send Go you over, over there. Here. That's yeah, funny. just like get out of here, man. Get out of my my sight. Like I don't, we don't want you here. Um, no, she was she was really nice about it, but she was like, no, if if you're looking for reading a bunch of ancient things, yeah, you you don't. This is not it. Sorry. Um, which is great. She sent me on my way, and I found my people, so to speak, and Yay. then I and then I was so so happy. But 
you know, I, I have friends uh, in anthro, obviously, <laughs> you know, I'm talking to you, but um, right. And you took but, all my classes, so you clearly didn't hate it, you know. <laughs> well, it's it, it's funny because that that's a fun story. Should should I grace people's ears with the story? Sure, it's let's, really, it's, yeah, it's really cute. <laughs> all right, so really quickly, um, I was slated in my uh, it was the the first semester of my fifth and final year, my super senior year, and I was supposed to be taking a it was I think it was a cultural anthropology class oh gosh it it was some it was something (laughs) and the professor like a week or two before classes started we got an email saying um so this professor kind of needed emergency like surgery he got his appendix out or something and so they were kind of like we're gonna start on time but you're just you're gonna have like a grad student come and teach you the first few classes So I got to class not knowing what to expect because this was like the first anthro class I'd taken at Mizzou. And uh, Jessica was actually (laughs) the the sub. So surprise grad student. (laughs) Right. So she walks in and she just starts her little PowerPoint up and then she gives that very first lecture. So at the end of that, what, like 50 minute class Mm -hmm. um, at the end of it, I was like, man she sounds so (laughs) cool Uh, she's funny she's got great powerpoints and so then I was like oh I I hope that the real professor teaches like her because I was like she like her teaching stuff it's my learning style it's really interactive like it's just really good so I think did you do one or two classes I don't remember I I think think it might have just been one yeah I can't I can't remember that would have been like fall of 2016 probably no, fall Ooh, 17. No, 17, yeah, fall, fall 17. 17. Okay. I, I think it was only the one actually, but I, I just remember. So at yeah. the, like at the end of the, the class though, cause you were saying, yeah, you're, you know, doctor, whoever it was is coming back next week. Uh, but you were like advertising for one of Mizzou's uh, programs or thing. I forgot you were advertising for something. So you you put your your email up and said all right this is my email if you want to hear more about this program uh-huh. email me <laughs> and then you put your office number so you were like here if you want to come talk to me like this is mm-hmm. where my office is and so I kind of like wrote them down in my notebook thinking all right well I she's really cool so if anything <laughs> I'd like to just talk to her again um and and like be her best friend so um <laughs> I so yeah then the then the professor came back and um and he was not anywhere near as entertaining let me tell you I it was so <laughs> sad I really wanted to like the class because it was really interesting but I just felt yeah like so dry so dry and just, <laughs> just like, a totally different style oh god it was it was just uh, <laughs> I don't know how I made it through that class because I was just I I hate to admit it now but it, it was really boring after because he just stood up there and just would say in the most monotone slow way <laughs> so I was just like I can't do this this is horrible um so yeah I what you whatever you were advertising for it mm-hmm. was definitely geared I can't toward even remember yeah oh I think it was Mizzou's reactor oh okay and Mizzou has that yeah. special reactor yeah lab. we have that mm-hmm. yeah the archaeometry lab yeah yeah so you were really advertising cool. for that and so I thought it sounded cool but I knew in my heart of hearts as much as I wish I could get involved with that I was like it's sciencey and it's it, it, it's really not designed for people like me who just want to read books and study ancient myths so uh, I, I was like, well, if anything, I have her email, so I suppose I can make up a reason to, to go talk to her. Um, <laughs> but then I didn't need to because then a few weeks later, I started um, looking at the, the course schedule for creating my last semester of undergrad. And then mm-hmm. I saw anthro significant discoveries in archaeology. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, that sounds cool. And that would get my last non-major or minor requirement that I need to graduate and then I was like okay but who's teaching it or else I'm gonna find something else <laughs> and then I see your name and I'm like wait isn't it that grad student so I like check my notebook the universe is it, aligning <laughs> and it was you and I was like oh oh she's teaching this oh for sure I'm taking it so I took the class and uh, that's how I got in and then uh at, at the time I I didn't actually check your name when I signed up for it but I, I it 
vaguely was familiar. So I was mm-hmm. like, I think this is that same grad student. So I, I can always oh. drop it if it's not her. <laughs> right. So I put it on and then I was kind of like waiting first day of class. I was like, okay, okay. I hope it's her. I hope it's her. Cause otherwise it's going to be really awkward. <laughs> yeah. And then you walk right in you're just like, Hey, what's up guys? Let's go. <laughs> like, I'm Jessica. I'm a grad student. I was like, Oh, this is her. I was like, yeah, this is her. <laughs> So yeah, and then uh, and, and then the rest we, and was then, history. <laughs> the rest was history. We took that class, uh, as you know, I was I'm I was that student who lived in office hours. It, like, but we had so much fun. I I loved talking about you know the different topics and also like your perspective as a classic student. You know, because again, like I I kind of I live in that world. You know, working in the ancient Mediterranean, but I don't. I don't quite have that background. So anytime, you know, I get to talk about that stuff, like that's why I always love our, our chats and, you know, our FaceTime talks that we've kept up with, you know, it's just, it's, it's fun to kind of like enter that world and kind of broaden my perspective. So, yeah. yeah. And I mean, you can explain all the sciencey things to me <laughs> that I don't, I don't understand. And I'm like, uh, help, help. I'm like, Jessica, I need your help. Um, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I didn't know at the time if you thought it was like weird, like, why is this one chick always <laughs> coming to my office hours? I'm trying to get work done here. <laughs> um, but I will tell you, it's because I lived in the classics building. I lived in Swallow. If I wasn't in your office, mm-hmm. I was upstairs on the third floor talking to Dr. Wallach. I was mm-hmm. literally I would just spent hours in her office also because she had the chocolate drawer so I could Ooh, just go get true, chocolate yeah. whenever <laughs> but like she wouldn't kick me out she would just be like I love having you here and then even when she would like have to teach she would for for all of us who just would gather and consistently live in her office she'd be like mm-hmm. okay you have the chocolate in this drawer she's like I'm gonna go Aww. teach but she's like it's only a 50 minute course I'll be back she's like I'll keep my office open if you guys want to just sit and study in here. Like I'll be Aww. back. Um, but if you leave, if you have to go, just remember turn off the light and like close the door because I'll lock it so that way it'll automatically. Lie. She was just mm-hmm. wonderful. So, so nice. I lived yeah. there, and then the classics lounge right above. So I was mm-hmm. always just floating around. But I just I like the conversation. I like the company, and I like yeah, talking we about had some good chats, cool things. So you know, I was like, all right, well, if. Uh, no one's in the classics lounge. I'm gonna just head one floor down, see if Jessica's in her office. Right. Uh, you know, have a real good time. And then uh, half the time, Gwen was in there too, mm-hmm. um, yeah. which was really, really fun. I don't know. Do, do you miss sharing an office with Gwen? Because I, I, I mean, do. that the fellow sort of like anthropologist kind of thing mm-hmm. would have been fun, right? Yeah. Yeah. We had a lot of fun. We, 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 we recently got kind of uh, moved around. We got some new grad students and uh, Gwen finished her master's degree and uh, she's working on our PhD with a, with a different professor. So she kind of, she got moved upstairs to the third floor. Um, so I definitely missed having her around, um, you know, and we had a lot of good chats too, but uh, you know, Aww. things, things change, I guess, but we still talk regularly. So that's, nice Oh, too. that's good. <laughs> I, you know, and it's funny cause I, I talked to so many undergrad students who just could not believe that they're just flabbergasted at they were like you were friends with your professor (laughs) like that's weird like why were you in there when you didn't need to be like you just go talk and sit for hours there or you know oh you would actually go talk to your TA like oh that's like (laughs) weird they're like grad students with their own friends and this and the other thing and I say it but some of your best friends can be made if you go talk to these amazing professors. I mean, yeah, some people might say, well, I'm going to just sort of go make friends with them. So I get a good letter of rec. Obviously you always want a good letter of rec for whatever, but Mm -hmm. I'm like, you can learn so much from these people who are there to share their wisdom with you. So why not take advantage of office hours? I know so many people who are like office hours. What's that? I never even went unless (laughs) I really was in trouble or needed help. Or they were like, I just email a question. And I'm like, okay little miss Most, email <laughs> right I can't speak for everyone of course um but I would say as a grad student and as an instructor who had my own class like I enjoy when people stop in for office hours yes if no one's there you get work done that's fine but like that's the whole point of office hours so people can stop by and you know sometimes it's it's kind of boring if you don't have anybody coming to ask questions so it's always nice when students pop in and say hi or you know talk about the class and also like as you said like it's good to build up that relationship for letters of rec for you know advising talking about classes um, 
you know, making career plans and things like that. I, uh, I've gotten better about this, but I'm a naturally shy person. And that is one of my regrets. Like after I finished my undergrad, I I had a really, really wonderful undergraduate advisor, Dr. Amber Johnson. Um, And she at Truman State, she was fantastic. Um, You know, and I still catch up with her at conferences and stuff as much as I can. But that's one of the things like, I was like, I should have spent more time, you know, talking to her, building that relationship, you know, talking about her research. She does such really interesting things. And so when I became a TA, I was like, go to, I would tell my students, go to office hours, go and talk to them. Like it's, it it makes it much more personal when we can put a face to the name on that grade book. Like, you know, we can check in and see how are you doing? You know, if there's like some test questions you're struggling with, you know, it's easier for us to, you know, start that conversation and be like, Hey, you know, do you need help with this? Like, you know, is there some stuff you want to talk about? Are there some concepts that really, you know, just aren't coming through? So like it it can really, it can be very helpful. Um, But again, you know, every instructor is different. There are some, you know, professors or TAs that, you know, might not be as open, but that that's the human element of it right mm-hmm. i mean when i think about the constant funding problems or just the fact that no one knows your friendly neighborhood anthropologist or your <laughs> friendly neighborhood classicist you know mm-hmm. okay well why do movies not get made about these people why don't you want to write more books about these people and i think it's honestly just cuz it's like i don't know if it's like this for other majors programs departments whether because of size or just like vibe dynamic or something but um, I've always found the humanities to be usually like the more, the, some of the most personable, wonderful people because mm-hmm. they're small departments. So everyone gets to know each other because um, there's just no way you wouldn't know. If you don't personally know them, mm-hmm. you definitely know of them. Like th- right. just, just the nature of small departments. Um, obviously, it's harder if you're like the history department or the psychology department. You know, you could very well have thousands of students at a big (laughs) school so you're not going to get to know everybody but this is an opportunity where it's small enough that if you make the effort Mm -hmm. everyone's going to be really nice like you can go up and just talk to anyone any of my professors I was like okay I don't know them very well but if I wanted to I could just go up and knock on the door and be like hey so just start talking you know um yeah I don't know I I feel like maybe if more people saw these wonderful like in intra department dynamics maybe mm-hmm. it would encourage people to I don't know maybe get more involved because then you think oh I want to join such a collegial department or yeah. hey I just want to learn more about them hey I'm writing a book let me let me like talk to you I'll see you're really cool and then maybe mm-hmm. I'll be inspired to make my hero uh, an anthropologist I don't know mm-hmm. we, need, we need more pop culture things for <laughs> anthropology I, I agree yes for sure for sure yeah like and I think that. also part of that is like just the nature of the field itself too. So whether it's classics or anthropology, what it boils down to is that we're, we're interested in human experience and how people interact. And, you know, if it's classics, you know, how people interact and create these, you know, these, this material culture, this, um, you know, this kind of, you know, composition. Um, And, you know, that's, the same thing kind of goes with the anthropology, but we, we, since we're studying those human experiences, most of us generally also like to kind of like exist in that realm too, you know, like humans are social creatures. So I think the people that are drawn to studying that, not maybe, maybe not all of them, but some of them are also, you know, just people, people. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, that's the nature of I mean, that's definitely the nature of a lot of these subjects. And it's funny you say that because it just reminded me, I recently spoke to Dr. Kathleen Coleman, who's the chair of the Harvard uh, Classics Department, Mm -hmm. and she literally calls classics, at least, uh, a study of the human condition. She says it's... Oh, yeah. She said classics are the laboratory of the human condition. And that just stuck with me because I said, it's true, though. I mean, okay, maybe Mm -hmm. we're not like anthropologists specifically studying people but in some way you know all these questions we're trying to answer these historical ones philosophical ones that's still studying that like human condition really just maybe from oh absolutely the more theoretical non-scientific point but um Mm -hmm. you know to have you guys then actually studying people from a very scientific point and then 
combine that with our theoretical sort of um, research, mm -hmm. you get kind of a nice whole picture. So uh, oh, absolutely, it yeah. makes so much sense that our departments historically are just kind of together. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the aspects I love the most. I Can I just tell you, I remember <laughs> really quick, I remember when I finally had finished my last final for your class mm -hmm. uh, right before graduating. I could not wait to like cross from the student to TA <laughs> relationship to like the mm -hmm. frenzies category. So I remember I was like, okay, I'm, I'm leaving Columbia because I, I finished all my finals. Grades don't go in for another couple weeks after. And mm -hmm. I remember I was like, Jessica, can I like get your <laughs> phone number? Cause I want to text you and just like be your bestie. And I remember you were, you were just like, I'm so sorry. You were just like, it's not that I don't want to give it to you. I really do. But I have to wait for grades to go in. Cause, Cause you were just like, keep it official. Yep. Yeah. She's like, mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, school. So <laughs> I, I, so at that point we, we, we sucks just to, to email, uh, but the mm -hmm. moment grades went in, I, I literally had like a countdown. I was like, this is the day. This is the day. We're going to be friends. We're going to be best Tuesday, friends ever. 5 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so then we like passed that threshold. I then like, I, I, I think it was like doing something because I didn't even email you right then. But like the very next day, I was like, guess what day it is? And you're like, <laughs> okay, here's my number. All right. Chill, chill. Um, and, and so I feel like I've just been texting you nonstop since the day I got it. <laughs> We've had a lot of fun though. I feel like we have a lot of, we have a lot of good conversations and, you know, you're kind of like my classics link, you know, I'm like, what's happening in the classics world, you know? So it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. So, you know, what, and our little all, book club and our little book club, <laughs> All I, I will say it's just, it's so fun, whether you have a classics friend or an anthro friend or someone who, you know, maybe you're not doing the same thing, but they can relate it to you, but it, mm -hmm. you're close enough that you just sort of get each other kind of where you're coming oh, yeah. from mm -hmm. so um that's that's another reason why i'm like hey make a friend with your fellow classicist or your anthropologist they have really great insights to life and other things so i'm like yes do it do it <laughs> uh like i don't know what you're doing with your life if you're not trying to make friends with with all the classicists out there uh right. your life must be inherently <laughs> boring because we are here to just talk about the the intricacies of life and history mm -hmm. and coming in with those history hot takes and uh, yep. just the human experience it is the human all experience. times all places yep <laughs> oh gosh so anyway everyone who comes on the podcast uh will read percy shelley's ozymandias because it is my favorite poem of all time and i think that if classics are an, a, a look at the human condition then this poem to me is uh, like a reflection of the human condition. So uh, if you would read the poem and then just sort of tell me, you know, what are your initial thoughts? How does it make you feel? Uh, what does it evoke for you? That would be great. Okay. Ozymandias by Percy Shelley. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert near them on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings, Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. So do you have any, uh, like, anthropology hot takes for us? Ooh. Well, I guess, I mean, I don't know if this is necessarily anthropological, but I guess, you know, from, from my experience, so I, I had never, if I've read that poem before, I don't 
I don't recall. So like when you first started mentioning it, when I first learned about your podcast, I looked it up and I was like, Oh, that's, you know, that is really cool. Um, but you know, this, it seemed kind of new to me, but my, the impression that it leaves me with is, you know, kind of, as we talked about before, you know, part of the human experience, part of being human is, you know, reaching out, making connections with people, leaving marks on people. And I think that's kind of, you know, as humans, that's what we strive to do is connect. And maybe depending on, you know, your experience, your place in life, that's going to mean different things to different people, of course. Um, So I guess, you know, from, from Ozymandias' perspective, like that's, you know, his way of connecting is, creating these monumental works, you know, leaving his physical mark on the landscape. Cause I, I guess, you know, as humans, we just want to be remembered. You know, we want our time on this earth to, to mean something in some way. So <laughs> I guess that's just kind of the way I think about it. He's like, all right, here it goes. You know, I'm just gonna, gonna leave my mark, but you know, unfortunately time waits for no one. And, you know, these, these sorts of things aren't always, as permanent as we imagine them to be. So it's kind of, that's kind of what it evokes for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, There's so much meaning you can take out of it. I mean, I've had some lately, it seems like every other conversation with somebody about this poem, I've gotten just like 10,000 new different ways of thinking about it that I just like never would have thought about. Um, Cause it's funny. Cause I, I would say for me, you know, my, my base instinct is it's a look at hubris, at human hubris. Mm-hmm. It's, it's about the ephemeral nature of political power. It's yeah. Ozymandias was Ramesses the second. What did he do? He was the most powerful, wealthy person uh, in Egypt and the ancient world at that time. Look where he is now, his broken statue. Would we even know about him if it weren't for the artisan who created it? Um, mm. Just kind of, you know, things that we think would last forever that didn't because you can't do it alone. Right. So right. if I were to ask, what would be a modern day Ozymandias to you? What would you say? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, hmm. I don't know if I really have a good answer. I mean, you could kind of like, I guess kind of like our sort of <laughs> I, I don't know if other people agree or disagree, but the first thing that came to mind is like, you know, Jeff Bezos, <laughs> you know, all of these sort of like, I don't know if industrial is the right word, but you know, all of these like, you know, sort of commerce empires, you know, everyone's trying to kind of, you know, create their own little slice of the world and leave a legacy for, I guess, you know, but what do we really have? You know, like, how is there anything that can be permanent? Can we create anything that's permanent? You know, or is it just our relationships with other people that kind of live on? I don't know. <laughs> These are tough questions. Yeah. I mean, hey, I had somebody in the podcast the other day saying technology was mm-hmm. our modern Osmandius because, uh, you know, we, we, we're so wrapped up in tech now. Are we going to have this same kind of obsession with tech in 2000 years. I don't know. I mean, all I know is that the time, time moves forward. So we're always developing. I mean, Silicon Valley is huge and just, we just like our tech. So I'm going to assume that what we have today with zoom and laptops and Mm -hmm. iPhones in 2000 years, who knows, we can have teleportation by then, you know, flying (laughs) cars. We used to think of just as this fantastical thing that will never happen. And apparently according to some people, we're a lot closer to flying cars than, we think we are. People are like, well, you know, we haven't done it yet only because it's not economical because there's no rules for then how do you apply the rules of the road to the sky? So no one mm-hmm. wants to do that. But I mean, with the technology we have, people are like, we could have flying cars in 20 years. Like it's not yeah. that far. Cool. So, you know, who knows? Technology could be an Ozymandias. I mean, I think it will be around forever in some way. So I wouldn't say it's once great. That will be nothing. Um mm-hmm. Dr. Shanker, who I interviewed for the podcast, who we both mm-hmm. love. Yes. He's, he had a great example that has stuck with me that I like to quote all the time on the podcast now. He says a, an abandoned casino in Atlantic City is his Ooh. Ozymandias because we thought those things were going to just last forever and be blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And now they're abandoned. They're gone. No one yeah. you know, you just see it. And it's just 
decrepit, you know, and you're like, oh, mm-hmm. that thing. So is, if there's really such a thing as a, a modern Ozymandias, I don't know, but that's why I ask people. Um, well, I guess, I guess the interesting thing is that like, could we, at this point, can we even identify a modern Ozymandias? Cause the whole point, and to me, the whole point of the poem is, you know, something that seems so permanent that is, that is now practically lost to us. So I think it's one of those things that, you know, who knows what direction, you know, what's, what's going to be that thing that's, that's no longer visible on the landscape, you know, that's, yeah, I, I mean, some know, people, I mean, so, abstract. I mean, Dr. Shanker said casino, someone said technology, I like that one. Mm-hmm. um, who was it? Somebody the other day said, uh, like Trump tower, <laughs> um you know who who knows so i i don't know it's a it's one of those theoretical questions yeah that kind of reminds me right (laughs) um when i first started working in sicily um we visited kind of a day trip to the island of favignana which is just a a small coast small island just off the coast that you can get to by ferry and it's beautiful it's gorgeous and we rented bikes um and you can kind of like ride along just kind of ride the outskirts of the island. And then, you know, it was summer. So when you get warm, you just pull over into a cove and go swimming and eat lunch. And, you know, it's just a grand time. And um, we kind of like, were biking along this one stretch of road and there was this really large building, just huge, huge scale. Um, And it must've been some kind of, I don't know, hotel complex or something, but it was just completely gutted I don't know if it was ever finished but it was just kind of like this very eerie sort of skeleton of a building and it just it kind of makes you wonder you know what's what's the story behind it what's you know what's the mystery so I guess kind of that you know that Ozymandias you know these sort of monumental things you know what's when we're looking at things so far gone you know it's that's kind of maybe the draw for anthropologists and classicists is, you know, what's, what's the story behind these things? Like we love a good mystery. So. Well, the good part is uh, we can tackle that together. Just we'll provide the <laughs> historical context. You just look at the science. You, you find us the measurables, <laughs> which is, which is what Sounds I like good. to say. I'm like, y'all are good for finding what we're supposed to be measuring. We'll just provide you with the context and be like, well, we like this, this, and this. <laughs> and then you're, you'll you'll come in and say, all right, this is how we measure this, this stuff. Perfect. I love it. Um, <laughs> so thanks again for coming on the podcast, though. Yeah, it's been for super me. fun. I knew this was going to be an amazing conversation. And uh, yeah. Trireme Transit is now departing Ancient Odyssey. Next stop is Present Ponderings. I met a traveler from an antique land who said... Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. 